I'm Dr. Chris Simiklis. I'm a neurosurgeon that works in Adelaide. So I work at uh, Flinders Medical Centre, the Royal Adelaide in public, and I also work at the Memorial uh, Hospital and Flinders Private Hospitals. Thanks for being with us, Chris, today. That's okay. Um, so you're the first recipient of the NRF Dinning Memorial Neurosurgical Scholarship. And just to give our audience a bit of background, uh, Dr. Trevor A.R. Dinning was a leading Adelaide neurosurgeon and co-founded the NRF in 1963, along with Professor Donald Simpson. In 2021, so last year, um, Dr. Dinning's daughters, Nadia and Anthea, established the Dinning Memorial Neurosurgical Scholarship in his honour. And so that's been established to enable a neurosurgeon to complete further training in a special area or attend conferences so that um, they can further their knowledge in that particular area. So you're actually the inaugural recipient of that yes. scholarship. Thank so you. can you tell us a bit more about what area you'll be undertaking further training in? Sure. Firstly, thank you to the Dinning family and the NRF for awarding me this um, opportunity and this scholarship. And um, I'm hoping to use the funds for further training in my main area of interest which is in spinal uh, surgery uh, specifically endoscopic spine surgery which is a an exciting field not necessarily a new field but certainly in australia a field that hasn't been taken up um, widely just yet um, but heavily used in europe in the us and in asia uh, it's a it's an area that i'm, I'm particularly passionate in um, minimally invasive surgery and, and I think will have great benefits for patients in the future. So thank you again for the opportunity. And can you tell us a bit more about what exactly is endoscopic spinal surgery and how that's sure. different from what's currently yeah. happening? So most people would have heard about endoscopic surgery in general or um, in layman's terms, so to speak, keyhole surgery. So uh, it's now uh, an option for spinal surgeries, uh, anywhere from the cervical spine all the way down to the bottom of the spine, the sacral region. Uh, essentially, it's a, a minimally invasive approach to the spine and the pathologies that we're treating that uh, minimizes the destruction to normal anatomy in order to physically get to where the problem is. So um, great benefits for patients. Excellent. And so what training are you planning or presently undertaking? Sure, so um, with the help from the uh, Dinning Scholarship as well as some in industry support, I've been undertaking various cadaver courses and uh, attending conferences and also linking with colleagues from interstate who are currently performing endoscopic spine surgery. So I'm fortunate enough to have a close contact in Sydney, a previous neuros a neurosurgeon currently in Sydney who I've worked with as a trainee uh, years ago. Uh, so with his expertise, I'm trying to upskill uh, to become <clears throat> proficient and uh, you know, safely uh, able to perform these operations and, and benefit patients in Adelaide. And so what do you see as the future of endoscopic spinal surgery here in Adelaide? So. Uh, I'm not the only person interested in this field. There are other spinal uh, and neurosurgeons interested in Adelaide. So uh, together as a community, we'll come together and support each other, uh, particularly at the start of uh, undertaking spine surgery. Um, and yeah, we'll be able to continue the, um, the practice and upskill and including training of other surgeons in future. So um, yeah, I, although I'm particularly interested, there are other surgeons that are also um, interested. And you touched on this a bit already, but what do you see as the potential benefits for patients with this type of surgery? Sure, so uh, the key is the um, minimally invasive nature of these operations. So a patient will have a very small incision and uh, insertion of the endoscope or the camera directly to the site of the pathology. And uh, for the surgeon, visualize the problem uh, on a big monitor um, and basically cause minimal destruction to muscles and other structures that require dissection to get to the problem. Uh, that will then allow flow and effect of quicker recovery from um, the surgery. So traditional open approaches, a patient will often have significant discomfort and may take several weeks longer to recover, whereas these procedures, patients can actually have a day procedure and go home the same day. Um, and then actually return to normal activities much quicker than they could otherwise if they were to have a more traditional approach. Uh, I guess further advantages uh, in patients who are, um, have significant other medical comorbidities or a high risk for a general anaesthetic, 
these procedures can in fact be done and are commonly done under local anaesthetic uh, with the patient awake essentially and that will be an option for patients as well. Fantastic and are there any downsides to this type of endoscopic spinal surgery? Uh, not so much a downside, but more that the application of endoscopic spine surgery uh, is not necessarily for every case uh, that we can do traditional approaches, particularly if it's a, a large uh, multi-level problem or for spinal fusions. Uh, there is an option to do an endoscopic spinal fusion, but traditional op uh, options are still probably um, more commonly done because of the effectiveness. So. It's more the limitations of endoscopic spine surgery rather than downsides that I see. Yeah. At this stage, is it particular operations and procedures that this can be applied to, or is it um, looking at a broad range of...? Um, generally speaking, uh, the most common pathology we manage is uh, a disc herniation, causing pressure on a nerve and causing pain down the leg or the arm, or sciatica more commonly for the lower limb. Um, so where there's a small disc bulge that traditionally we would make a s bigger opening and, and approach uh, the pathology, we can now uh, dock directly where the problem is and uh, a very targeted, um, you know, quick uh, operation to reach the pathology and, and help the patient. But there are other applications, so decompressions uh, or laminectomies as we call them in the lumbar spine, thoracic spine and cervical spine. And as I touched on prior, uh, there are there is the potential to do fusion operations, which traditionally patients do have significant post-operative discomfort and are slower to recover. Um, if, if we can do a minimally invasive approach, um, then this would have significant benefits for patients. That sounds great. Well, it's great yeah. to hear how that'll um, benefit patients, especially here in Adelaide. So, and again, we'd like to thank the Dinning family as well yes. for being able to offer such a fantastic scholarship. How many years did it take to train to become a neurosurgeon? So I finished high school in 2002 and finished my neurosurgical training last year, so 19 years essentially to become a neurosurgeon. Wow. What's the most hours you've ever worked in one week? Well, that's a tough question, but I would say close to 100 hours. Um, not necessarily as a neurosurgeon, but during the training, which can be quite hectic uh, as a neurosurgical trainee. Um, yeah, close to 100 hours, I would say. What's the longest you've ever gone without sleep? So I value my sleep. Um, so believe it or not, I've not had a day where I haven't at least had a short stint of sleep. So a day, I would say, is probably the longest I've gone. What was your first surgery on a real patient? So as a medical student in uh, Launceston in my final year of medical school, I uh, did a very small operation, but exciting for me at the time. It was incision and drainage of a groin abscess. Ooh. And do you remember your first surgery, your first neurosurgical surgery? Uh, I do. Um, generally speaking, you start with minor procedures, so insertion of a, an intracranial pressure monitor was my first procedure. What's the longest surgery you've ever performed? As the primary surgeon, I'd say uh, a staged complex spine operation, which was in the order of uh, eight hours. And was that also the most complex surgery? Yeah, I'd say so. It was a um, cervical um, problem where the patient had severe arthritis and osteoporosis and, and required an approach from the front and from the back of their spine. And what's the most surgeries you've ever performed in one day? Well, if you count minor procedures in addition to majors, uh, probably in the order of eight procedures. Yeah. And what would you say is your most common surgery? Definitely a lumbar um, discectomies and laminectomies. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Sweet or savoury? Oh, I used to be savoury, but I'd say sweet now. And favourite sport and team? So at the present time, Formula One and Red Bull. Um, we'll switch gears a bit. So as sure. you may know, August is actually Neurosurgery Awareness Month. Yes. So we wanted to ask, are there any aspects of neurosurgery that you wish there was more awareness around? Oh, look, uh, I guess it's important to recognise the impact that certain neurosurgical pathologies can have on patients and their families. Um, so I know there is a fair bit of awareness uh, in various fields of neurosurgery, but I think it's important again to emphasise the uh, impact of traumas, head injuries, particularly in young patients. Unfortunately, uh, young males with their uh, risky behaviours uh, tend to be the 
the higher risk patients um, in terms of motor vehicle accidents or traumas uh, with head injuries that can affect them for the remainder of their life and, and not only them but also their, their family and, and uh, next of kin uh, family support network. Um, so I think it's important again to emphasise and have awareness about um, the impact that head injuries have um, and you know, support pa patients recovery as best as we can. And can you give us an example of a day in your life as a neurosurgeon? I wake up bright and early, thankfully I'm a morning person, uh, brekkie. Uh, if I'm lucky enough, the kids wake up before I leave, help them have their brekkie and get them ready for work. Uh, my wife is uh, not a morning person, so <laughs> generally uh, get the day started for her uh, and then head to work. Uh, having multiple roles, the day will depend uh, from day to day, but head to hospital, do a ward round clinic, surgery, uh, and if I'm on call, then manage those duties. Eventually get home, who knows what time that is, uh, and then have some time again with the kids and, and get to sleep. And what about in your spare time? What do you enjoy doing? Do you have any passions outside of neurosurgery? Uh, I don't have that much time nowadays, I must admit, but uh, I do have three young children who um, take up most of my time and uh, I enjoy various activities with them. Uh, I used to play lots of sports but um, if I can get out on the golf course then I, I love to still do that um, but you know, the team sports, soccer and uh, footy that I used to play I have less time for unfortunately but yeah I'm trying, trying to find the balance between work and, and life which is difficult but not impossible. So just to finish off, do you have a quirky or interesting fact about the brain, spine or neurosurgery? More of a historical fact that maybe other neurosurgeons may not appreciate themselves, but um, although Harvey Cushing has been labelled as the father of modern neurosurgery, in fact, uh, Dr. Horsley predates uh, Harvey Cushing as the first neurosurgeon, and he was a British uh, uh, surgeon. There you go. Thanks for that. That's okay. And thanks again for taking the time to interview with us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you again to the Dinning family and the NRF and industry for supporting my uh, pursuit to learn endoscopic spine surgery and hopefully benefit uh, our patients uh, and the wider community in, in South Australia.